gather together in worship. It is a beautiful opportunity and a beautiful time to thank God for, first and foremost, who he is and the fact that he's chosen to reveal himself to us through our song. And so as we praise God, I would ask you to lift up your voices in praise to the king because this is real. I know I've said that over and over and over again, but this is real. And we believe it, we know it, we profess it, we proclaim it, and God's word says it is real too. So remember that the next time that we gather to worship. As we raise our voices to the king, let that not be something where we just passively skate by or or just kind of mouth the words, but this is your eternal salvation. And I can guarantee that if if a man came in here and, 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 and saved my life, physically, I'd be wanting to tell everybody about him. How, man, that guy jumped in front of a truck for me and he saved my life. But this is about something much more important. This is about the one who has the ability to save your eternal soul. So consider that in your worship and consider that as you, uh, you, you, you go throughout your day and you, when you leave those doors and you enter the mission field, think about the fact that someone actually died for you eternally then what a glorious and beautiful gift that is and what that should motivate in our hearts of praise and worship of the man, God, Christ Jesus. Father, thank you, Lord, uh, for the beauties of Christ. God, I, I, my heart's desire is to present, God, the pearl of great price, the hidden treasure, Lord, that was worth selling everything that we had just to buy the field that had the treasure in it. That treasure is Christ. God, that beauty is Christ. That glorious, holy gift is Christ. God, who you say is currently seated at the right hand of your throne, awaiting your command to return to this earth. God, we serve that King. We serve you and we love you. And as we read from Jesus Christ's younger half-brother, James, continuing on in, in, in this series, God, let us understand the power of our words, both the power for good and the power for evil. And God, let us understand the underlying um, design that you have put on humanity, first and foremost, to glorify you and to enjoy you and to worship you. And we should think about how much of that is done with our tongue. Father, it's in your name we pray, in accordance with your will we ask. Amen. What a joy it has been to uh, continue on in James. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me to James chapter 3. And this again, just uh, in the logical flow of because we believe in numbers and the fact that numbers are successive, uh, we are now in James chapter 3. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 12, and then we're going to work through every one of those verses. Uh, and I have just absolutely enjoyed being able to get into what James says practical Christianity is. Uh, what does it actually look like to be a Christian? W- what are the things that, that exemplify uh, the, the outworking of the faith that I proclaim that I have? Because we know that, that if, a, if a duck gets up here and he's dressed in a Rottweiler costume and that Rottweiler kind of waddles across the stage and it starts quacking, Everybody's going to say, there is something wrong with that dog, because that dog kind of looks like a duck, and it's quacking like a duck, so it can't be a dog. And we don't want that to be said of us as it pertains to being Christians. We don't want that, because the world is constantly looking for a way to put Christians down. Uh, You look at the most vilified religion anywhere on the planet, it's real Christianity. It's it's real Christianity. Um, to the point now, I know Christy read me a, a news headline, I'm sure it's old and out of date, uh, but I think this was a few weeks ago, to, to the point now where the Vatican in Rome, and again, uh, this is just speaking of Catholicism, all right? Not, not of Christianity, of Catholicism. The Vatican has ceded the right to appoint um, bishops or popes in certain regions in China to the government because the government has uh, essentially taken over all uh, public religious rights. And we know that true Christians there are persecuted, um, that a Bible can get you killed or a Bible can get you thrown in a work prison for the rest of your life. And so we should be thankful that we can can unashamedly bring our own Bibles to church and read them in our our home if we so desire. So think about that blessing. Um, and, And again, as we understand what it is with our speech, the way that we talk, will indicate the condition of our heart and the faith that we proclaim. 
So James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Please read with me. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For if we stumble, excuse me, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also, so also, think about that. We've, we've gone from our, our, our examples there. So also, now this is us. The tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life. And it is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we have the, we, with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh Again, this beautiful, James is so masterful in his use of analogies, of, of, of very simple uh, analogies in nature that we can then just grab those and draw from those and understand, okay, well, wait, this makes sense here. And Jesus used a lot of agrarian examples. He talked about fields and seeds and plants and bushes and fruit and grapes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he did all of those because they were common for us all right, in the physical realm to be able to go out and interact with these things. All right, uh, I'm, uh, my wife jokes, she, she, she again, I, I, I'm, I don't claim to be a farmer, and I think everybody knows that here, um, but uh, I just learned what transom lines were this last week. I didn't know what they were, all right, and, and so, so as we look at, at, at different things out in the field, I, I know that, guess what, I know this very simply, this, this might shock some of you, but if you don't take a seed and plant it into the ground, nothing's going to grow up out of there that looks like the plant you want to plant. Surprise. <laughs> That's a shock, isn't it? And so James uses a lot of the same examples that his brother did, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, look, surprise. This is the principle I'm trying to draw. If I've said this spiritual truth and then I paint it with something that you'll actually understand in the physical realm, if you reject that physical analogy, that's just really foolish. And so we should be you know, really intently paying attention to the things that James has said here. So his first warning, again, his first warning, this is uh, James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2a. So when you see this in writing, uh, if you see 2a, right, this is just going to indicate usually that the, that that one sentence in English has been broken up into two different sections. So usually it'll have an a and a b, sometimes it'll have a c. So here it's going to be the first half of verse 2. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. Our first point, real believers must not desire to teach too quickly. Real believers must not desire to teach too quickly. And as we look at this text in its totality, but also this, this small section here, we must be forced to understand that our words carry power. One of, the, one of the things that I, I remember my mom telling me when I was a kid, everybody knows this rhyme, you guys can complete it, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never, that, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie. My mom didn't mean that to be mean, and if your mother said it to you or you said it to your children, you did not say that to be mean to them, but it's simply not true biblically. And as we look at the power that words carry or that words have, and we, we contrast that Old Testament and New Testament, we understand, if you read uh, Ecclesiastes or Proverbs or Psalms, that our words, the very things that come out of our mouths, carry with them the power of life and death. Well, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that, that words carry the power of life and death. 
Look at what's happened to our culture. Look at what's happened to our culture. Hop online and read news stories of child after child after child after child or adult after adult after adult after adult that has taken their own lives because they were bullied by people online. And they typed those words. Nobody physically attacked them. Nobody even spoke to them. But through the power of transmission of words that caused people to take their own lives. That's something to consider. That's something to think of. And again, are not wars and fights and the very fractures that we see in our own society started by words? Rhetoric. Agendas. Things that are promoted usually by a very brilliant orator or by a very poor orator who gets enough attention. We should consider the power of our words. Uh, another interesting uh, assertion put forward by the Bible is the eternal nature, excuse me, the eternal nature of our words. Matthew 12, 36 through 37 says this. This is Jesus. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned again jesus isn't saying that your words are the the, the very things or the essence of what justifies you because we know that the bible clearly asserts that uh, we are justified by faith alone in christ jesus all right but he's saying that ultimately at the end we're going to prove the fact that we were justified by the words that we speak and the things that we do or we're going to be condemned for the words that we speak or the things that we do. This is really interesting. Uh, from a physical science perspective, uh, there may be some truth in the physical realm to this as well. So scientists, and again, people much smarter than I am. Uh, my, my brother, for example, is a brilliant mathematician. I never, I, I, he was terrible at math when he was younger, so I don't know how he got better when he got older. But my brother um, knows a lot about sound waves and a lot about how they move through the air and antennas and antenna theory, et cetera, et cetera. Scientists as a whole, and again, this is delving into some very technical stuff, scientists as a whole believe that uh, it would be possible, all right? So as I speak, and if, if I'm unamplified and I'm speaking this way, it's not that the, the sound waves that come out of my mouth dissipate and die. It's that they spread further and further and further apart. And if we had the ability to sense those and recondense them with technology, in theory, we would actually be able to hear things that were spoken in the past. Think about that for a second. It's very interesting. Granted, I'm going to argue from the Bible because that's where I make all my arguments from, uh, but the necessity of watching our speech as it pertains to leadership and teaching within the church is something that we should pay attention to. Uh, James 3, 1 through 2a simply asserts that teachers will be judged more severely for their speech than others, and I, as the teacher up here right now, and again, this, this pertains to all teaching within the church, all teaching within the church, okay? So not just the office of the pastorate, but how the deacons speak, and the deaconesses speak, all right? Our trustees, how they speak, down to the Sunday school teacher, how they speak, or the youth helper who's, who's counseling or guiding a young person, all right? Every single one of those people will be judged more strictly for the words that come out of their mouth than the layperson. I will be judged on the words that come out of my mouth, which will form the sermon, the doctrinal statements of the sermon, the exposition of the sermon, and the delivery of the sermon. In sum total, everything. And outside of various analogies, my heartfelt desire is to speak the very words of God and to break down the words of God in order to explain what God has already said. I do not desire, and I don't want ever at any point to speak the things that J. Johns is interested in or that J. Johns wants to try and talk about. I desire to speak the things that God has commanded to be spoken about. That's why this position or any position of teaching in the church must be strictly rooted in scripture rather than opinion, rather than personal thought. Because teachers will be judged for their words more strictly than the layperson. Now finally, James says, we all stumble in many ways. And, and as I look back at the text in this immediate section, for we all stumble in many ways, 
This is not willful, blatant, unrepentant sin where you're like, yes, I'm going to do this sin here. And oh, I'm sorry, I just stumbled into it. No, that's not at all what James is talking about. He's talking about the fact that words and the power of the tongue, all right, happen. I've said things I've regretted. And I've said things that I've apologized for from the pulpit. Why? Because I'm judged for my words. Right? And, and that's, that's my responsibility to be accountable for the words that I speak just as much as everyone else is to be accountable for the words that they speak. Now, the Bible says in many words there are sin, and the more we open our mouths, the more likely we are to say something that is not true or not 100% factual. And we can stumble into that. That's possible. Everyone here has done that before. I think colloquially we would say that's putting your foot in your mouth. Remember what James says is that we must be, and this is hearkening back to earlier sermons, that we must be quick to listen and slow to speak. What has our culture done? It's taken both of those principles and it's absolutely flip-flopped them. Our culture says, you be the first one to get out your opinion and your feelings and what you want to say. You can listen later. That's what our culture says. And if you look at social media, you look at the news, you look at interviews, you look at debates... You look at anything along those lines, what does everybody want to do? They want to do this, they don't want to do this. That's really foolish. Natural analogy, uh, totally off the cuff here, but it works. Uh, I have been to some really heinously dangerous jungles in my life. And if you do not listen when you're in that jungle, you will die. To be perfectly honest, if you walk through a jungle inhabited by some of the baboons that I've seen in my life, legitimate jungle baboons, which are terrifying, think of uh, about a human-sized monkey when they stand up with a nose snout region that's about a foot and a half long full of teeth that look like it came out of a lion, uh, and they can run like 50 miles an hour. And there's 200 of them. (laughs) And they work together. (laughs) If you run through the jungle and all you do is talk, very quickly you'll be someone's lunch. And so that's, again, another natural analogy for thinking about why should we listen more? Well, because it's smart. Our next section, James 3, 2b through 5a. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into horses' mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, or today diesel engines or nuclear engines, they're still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Our second point, the tongue, though small, is powerful and capable of great good. The tongue though small, is powerful and is capable of great good. How amazing is this text? Now, in, in, in some cases, the word in the New Testament, when we use the word uh, perfect, uh, which is derived from teleos, in the Greek, teleos, all right, that can sometimes be translated as uh, mature or complete. Uh, overwhelmingly, it's, it's translated literally perfect. And I would adhere that this, this rendering of the NASB is actually correct. If you were able to perfectly bridle your tongue, you're perfect. Who's the only person in human history that did that? (laughs) Jesus. Perfect, right? And so as we understand the power of our words and the power of the things that we say and how quickly we can say something that's either not true, hurtful, insulting, mean, angry, divisive, slanderous, etc., and how quickly we can walk into those if we're not guarding our heart, well, because Jesus said what? It's not, it's, not, it's not what goes into the body that defiles a man, it's what comes out of the body. For out of the heart, murders, slanders, adulteries, fornications, wickedness, etc. Spoken about. I, gear, I, I, I mean this not to be crass, but no serial killer in human history or school shooter in human history did not indicate with their words publicly what they were about to do, or that there was something very wrong with them. And if people had listened to them, they would have been able to say very quickly, there is something wrong with this child's heart. There's something wrong with this man's heart. We need to pay attention to them and help them and work through what they're going through because we may be able to prevent a great evil. Hmm. 
Again, I, I, I'll stand behind this, this direct translation of teleos is perfect in the text. If you can perfectly bridle your tongue, you're a perfect person. We should strive for that because God says, I'm holy, therefore be holy. Jesus said the same thing. Essentially, you should emulate me. And if you emulate me, you are emulating someone who was perfect. Now, look at the examples that James uses. And I, I like this one because I, I, this is a fun story. Uh, first, the horse. And everyone around here has seen a horse. They're beautiful, powerful creatures. Now, I, I remember as a young man, I was 16 years old, I was working in Texas on a cattle ranch uh, for a summer. And that was a new experience for me, you know, waking up at like 4.30 in the morning and getting out, preparing horses and getting out and actually driving cattle and fixing fences and doing things like that. And we had this one horse. He was my favorite horse. His name was Duke. And Duke was 19 and a half hands tall, and he was an American quarter horse. So basically what I just told you is he was a freak of nature, right? So an absolute monster of a horse. He was just ridiculously large, all right? So, so to put that in perspective for you, uh, 19 and a half hands tall, that's 78 inches from the ground to where you would put the bottom portion of the front part of the saddle, that's six and a half feet off the ground where the bottom part of the saddle goes. Big horse, real big horse. And, and Duke was uh, my favorite horse for a, a number of reasons. He had a terrible gait. It, was not, it wasn't necessarily fun to, to, to walk with Duke or to trot or to canter. It, it felt awful. But when you got on top of Duke, it was like driving a tank. All right? And the cows above all horses feared Duke. First and foremost, because he was enormous and he made his presence known, but secondly, because he would bite very forcefully the cows when they did not do what he wanted them to do. And so then the cows would move. I remember one day I was, I was, uh, I was, I was gonna bridle Duke up and he had his head down and, uh, and I, I, I put the bridle with a bit in there and, and uh, I reached over the top, over the top of his neck to, to just buckle it because his head was naturally down and Duke heard something off in the distance. And so what did Duke do? Immediately, like all horses, shot his neck and his head straight up. So at one point, here's all 200 pounds of me, literally over the very end of his neck. And in a split second, my feet are like four feet off the ground. And he's just looking around like nothing's, nothing's bothering him at all. 200 pounds at the end of his neck, straight off the ground. What, what a, an amazingly strong creature Duke was. Yet I could step on a a mounting block because I couldn't even get up on the top of him. And I would get on top of Duke and I could literally grab the reins with one of my fingers and I could steer Duke wherever I wanted to go with a finger because there was a bit in his mouth. Amazing. Now, uh, the ships, this is our next, next point of a natural analogy. The, the, you know, James is using bits in the, the, the mouth of a horse, and now he's talking about rudders with a ship. Uh, Christy and I recently watched a documentary, and it was on uh, super ships, on mega ships, and one of them was the Hunter Laga, uh, which was, I think it was made in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, but a giant oil tanker, absolutely enormous oil tanker, over 1,000 feet long, and from the water level to the top of the ship, 215 feet. All right, it displaced 300,000 tons. Just an absolutely ridiculously large ship. The propeller weighed 78 tons, just the propeller. Now, the rudder weighed 18 tons. So then, the, the, again, just because this is the sermon and, you know, rudders and ships, it made me think about it. And so I actually did the math on it. Uh, if you take all that math into consideration for the sake of proportions, that rudder is 0.00006% of the overall weight of that ship. And yet it would drive that thing through the water and steer it very simply to where it needed to go. Why should we consider our speech? Because it's powerful for good. It's powerful for good. It can be very effectively uh, used to steer our efforts and to drive our efforts. How do you know who you want to vote for and how do you know which uh, world power is, is good or bad? <laughs> you listen, right? It's really simple. You, 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 you want to you find out the condition of, of someone's heart, probably your neighbor, We've, Christy and I have lived next to a number of people throughout our life, not here, but 
you can tell the condition of their heart inside of your own home as they're yelling at each other in their own home. Why? Because you could hear it. You could listen. Our speech is powerful to heal and to encourage and to direct and to exhort. And Paul to the church at Colossae says in Colossians 3, verses 8 and then 15 through 17, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishings, excuse me, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Huh, how do you do that? You speak them, you speak the psalms, you sing hymns, and you sing spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Likewise, the psalmist says in Psalm 35, 28, and my tongue shall declare your righteousness and your praise all day long. Now think about this for a second. How did God choose to reveal himself to everyone? Old Testament and New Testament. He didn't show up on the scene and, and, and like make some hand symbols. God didn't show up on the scene and draw a picture of himself. And then, and, then, and then just do pictographs, like hieroglyphs or something like that. God didn't show up on the scene and, and record a video where he's doing something and then show that video to people. No, he showed up and he spoke to them. Ah, huh. he called them by name. And if we think about the fact that our creator God has chosen to speak to us, and that is how he has revealed himself to us, and how he has revealed himself to us in his written word, which are words written down, we should consider the power of our speech. Now, in the conclusion of this set of verses, James is not speaking of the sin of boasting because remember, at the end of the section here, it says that uh, so also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. This is not speaking of the sin of boasting. Okay, I want you to understand that. Uh, take that out of your mind for a second. It's not speaking of the sin of boasting. Essentially, what he's saying is though the tongue is such a small portion of the body, it is capable of great things. Just like the bit in the horse's mouth, just like the rudder on the ship. Bit in the horse's mouth and the rudder on a ship don't boast. But they move something very powerful and very mighty effortlessly. Effortlessly, excuse me. Our next section, James 3, uh, 5b through 8. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire? And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Point three, the tongue, though small, is powerful and capable of great evil. The tongue, though small, is powerful and capable of great evil. Now, we see countless examples throughout our life, American history, world history, where someone is driving their automobile along a national forest, they're smoking a cigarette, and they flick that bad boy out in the woods. And that tiny little ember from the end of a cigarette burns hundreds of thousands of acres down, very careless. Very careless. Think of, uh, too, uh, even people who thought they did a good job at putting a campfire out. They're out camping, a family or, uh, you know, a trail life group. <laughs> and and they, they didn't do what was necessary to ensure that that fire was completely put out. They leave. And then the next day, a little wind comes. And that little wind picks up and it blows a little ember that's still on one of those burnt out logs into a flame, and then it burns a whole forest down. We see how quickly and how effortlessly our actions can produce forest fires. That's exactly what James is saying here. Uh, again, how great a forest fire, or excuse me, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. 
Now, as it pertains to us congregationally, specifically concerning our speech, I want to be perfectly clear in what I'm about to say. Perfectly clear. So I'm going to read this as close as I can to verbatim. If anyone in this church, if anyone who's listening online or is listening uh, via FM, etc., whatever means of communication we have employed to send out a message, if there's confusion or there's concern or there's a misunderstanding as it pertains to our worship or what is being preached, there's nothing sinful about that. Nothing at all. There's nothing sinful about being concerned, about being confused, or misunderstanding something, or not understanding something, etc. There's nothing sinful about that at all. Everyone here has my email. They have the church email. Uh, you, you have, uh, I'm sure, John's email, a lot of the diaconate's email, the trustee's email. We've got the church phone number. We've got the website. Uh, we've got uh, email, etc. And, and I want everyone here to know that you are welcome to voice your concerns, your confusion, or a misunderstanding or a, a lack of understanding over anything with us at any point. Period. And I've dialogued with a number of people in this church. And after they talk to me, this is usually what they say, yeah, you're easy to talk to. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a hard conversation. I enjoy talking to people about biblical things. And I think all, all of those congregationally who have spoken to me understand and they know that. I enjoy talking with people. It makes me happy. First off, because I'm getting to know a fellow brother or sister in Christ or I'm getting to lead someone to the gospel. Secondly, because we get to come together and look and see what God has spoken that's written down and we use that to determine the course of what we believe or what we think now my heart finds joy in the opening of bible of the bible with fellow christians and non-believers and sharing them with them the wonderful truth of god concerning any conceivable issue absolutely any issue Here's the proper way of dealing with concerns or confusions. If they pertain to me publicly is something that I've spoken or privately or something that I've done within the church or something that we as the diaconate uh, or the, the trustees have done, here's the proper biblical response for how to deal with those concerns and how to deal with those issues. Come visit with me at the church. There's one option. If you're uncomfortable, bring your family with you, uh, bring a deacon with you, uh, bring fellow congregants with you, and if you're not comfortable with that, call the church. Leave a message, I'll try and get back to you as soon as I possibly can, via telephone. If you're not comfortable with that, email me. If you're not comfortable with that, write me a letter. Um, if, there's, if there's any other means of communication that I'm missing, employ one of those means of communication. I'm, I'm begging you because I, I love to talk to people. I enjoy talking to people. It makes me happy. And I want to I share the convictions of my heart, which I believe are simply and firmly rooted in the Scripture. And I want to articulate those with people and to work through things. Now, if that's still uncomfortable to you, um, there's literally no other way of communicating with me. Literally, unless some new form of communication gets created in the next day. <laughs> At that point, it would be a, a choice on behalf of someone who has an issue or a concern or a misunderstanding um, to sinfully continue with a divisive attitude or a lack of a desire to reconcile or to work through feelings of hurt or frustration or anger, etc., we as Christians should desire to bring healing, reconciliation, and growth. And we should desire to do that with open hands and open arms and open hearts. Because that's what this actually is. We have to deal with the issues that, that come up as it pertains to life. And God has been so gracious, so incredibly gracious, in allowing the exact text that we're working with right now in chronological order of when I first came here to deal with some of the things that have been happening over the past couple weeks here within our own congregation. So here's a natural analogy because everyone here knows someone like this. Here's a natural analogy. A man realizes there's a great pain in his body. Typically this is older men. My grandpa was one of them. And he does not want to see the doctor. 
and the pain continues in his body, and he refuses to go get it checked out. And after a long period of time, and that pain has grown and grown and grown, eventually it gets to the point where it's unbearable and he goes to the doctor. And the doctor, after examining and taking blood tests and taking x-rays, etc., he looks at me and he says, Sir, if you had come to me when you first started experiencing this pain, I could have given you a small pill that would have fixed every one of your problems. Now, because you have not come to me until this was absolutely unbearable, I must do surgery and I must cause you more pain in order to fix your body. Everyone here knows someone like that in their life, or they've seen it, they've witnessed it, or they've been related to someone like that. I know I have. Here's the spiritual reality of that analogy. Please pay attention closely. A man or woman realizes that there's something that makes them uncomfortable or concerned or upset in their church. The Bible provides sound doctrine, sound advice in Matthew 18 by saying, go and speak with your brother or your sister about that issue, about that area of concern, about that problem, about your frustrations. The man or woman does not take this biblical advice and they feel their own uncomfortableness, their concern, or their anger grow because it's not going to go away on its own. They reluctantly speak to their pastor or their church leader. And that church leader or that pastor says to them, this was a very simple issue. A very, very simple issue to deal with. And lovingly and graciously explains how easy that is to deal with. Hmm. They'll say something like, I can see that all you needed was to talk with me and work through whatever it is you're feeling but instead you've chosen to let this hurt or concern or uh, anger fester, and through it you have added sin through gossip or divisiveness to the situation. We will have to deal with those issues now too because you are unwilling to take God's advice. Natural analogy, spiritual analogy. We have to be people who are willing to say, this makes sense here, and if I deny it here, that's just sin. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 19 through 21. This is Paul dealing with accusations from uh, the church at Corinth. All this time, you have been thinking that we are defending ourselves to you. And this is Paul and his leadership as they teach the church. Actually, it is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved, beloved meaning fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. For I am afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you to be not what I wish, and may be found by you to be not what you wish, that perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. And I'm afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you. And I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented of the impurity, immorality, and sensuality which they have practiced. My heart's desire is to see this church explode in its joy and growth and understanding of Jesus Christ to the wind with everything else. If we have nothing here, if, we, if this church disappears and all we have is a little covered open air section to sit on park benches and golf carts and folding chairs to worship the Almighty God, we would not be missing a thing because we would still have God and we would still have each other. So my heart and the love that I have in my heart towards every single person here and congregationally is that we grow in Christian love and Christian fellowship and Christian unity. And the Bible is very clear how we do that and the steps by which we take to ensure that those things actually happen. 
In the final section there, he, he talks about taming a bunch of different types of animals in short uh, for the sake of time. Everybody's seen Shamu. If you can train a killer whale, you can train just about anything, okay? If you can train an elephant, you can train just about anything. If you can train a lion, you can train just about anything. If you can train an 800-pound silverback gorilla to not just rip you apart and throw you out of the cage, you can do just about anything in terms of animal training. John apparently trained a bobcat at one time, or a cougar. Was it a cougar? It's a cougar. Yeah, he trained a cougar, all right, just so everyone knows. <laughs> so if we have the ability to do that, then we should also have the ability to control and train our tongue as Christians because we have something inside of us that's better than us, the Holy Spirit. Now, we must all heed the word of God and, and repent of our sins as it pertains to the tongue. And there have been things that I have said that I have asked for forgiveness in. To our diaconate, uh, to individual members of the congregation, and the congregation as a whole. Why? Because we can very quickly walk into sinning with our mouth. And if I, as the leader of, of this church, if I can do that, then at least we together should be willing to do that. Because that's the biblical method of, of, of asking for forgiveness of sin and reconciliation, of coming back together. Now James says the tongue is evil and hellish, and understand the word that he uses for hell there is not speaking of uh, hell proper. The word he actually uses in Greek is Gehenna. And Gehenna was a, a field just outside of uh, Jerusalem where if you go back in the Old Testament, uh, that's where the Israelites actually used to sacrifice their children to Molech. Right, when they were being influenced by pagan gods. And so uh, Gehenna became a very wicked place uh, as viewed by the Jews in the time of Jesus. And so they used it as a trash pit. And the way that you get rid of trash in every third world country I've ever been to is you burn it. And so Gehenna was literally a mountain of trash that was continuously at all times of the day and night forever on fire. He's not saying that the power of hell is what's setting your uh, tongue on fire, all right? Why? Because who's in control of hell? God, not Satan. Why? Hell was prepared for Satan and his angels. So we understand that, we understand, that. okay, well, hmm, got to think about that for a second. God's the one who's in control of hell, and James isn't talking about this. What is he talking about? Remember what the Israelites did back in the Old Testament, sacrificed their kids to Molech, a pagan god, which is not really a god, it's a demon. So James is attributing our speech, our negative speech, to demonic influence. That's what he's doing by using that specific language. He's also saying it's full of poison. It's death. Look at the language of someone... Uh, who, who does not understand the power of the tongue. It's Proverbs 18, verses 6 through 7. A fool's lips bring strife, and his mouth calls for blows, beatings. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are the snare of his soul. We should hold our speech, we should hold our actions, and we should hold our life in light of the truth that we proclaim. If we profess to be Christians and we look just like the world, this means nothing. I can't tell you how many people have had come, come to us in our ministry and say, what, what? you really hit on that a lot. It's because we've seen it a lot. I've been to a lot of places and I've preached in a lot of places. Once. <laughs> but we've seen that over and over and over again because it's plaguing the American church. I don't mean Christ's true church. I mean the American church. The American perspective of Christianity, you ask the average atheist or the person who used to be in church, well, why don't you go anymore? Because they're a bunch of hypocrites. They're frauds. Let us not be a people who is called hypocritical or fraudulent or false because that's just a slap in the face to Jesus Christ. Our next section of verses, closing it out, verses 9 through 12. With it being the tongue, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. 
Does a, a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. This conflict of the tongue, or good and evil, is inconsistent with God's design. Remember, if, if we flash back to, to Genesis, early Genesis, right? What, what, what did God say when it was all done? When he took his Sabbath, his rest, behold, everything was good. Everything was very good. Did God create evil? The answer to that is no. God did not create evil. Has he allowed for it? Yes, he has allowed for it because he's sovereign over all things. Ultimately, he knew that he would send his son to deal with that problem of evil and wickedness that separated humanity from himself. But when we look at everything that God has created, Adam and Eve created perfect, morally upright, and without spot or blemish in the garden, huh, a picture of heaven, a picture of unity with God, a picture of conversation and togetherness with God, we realize that that was untainted and unspoiled. The lips brought everything down. Did God really say, said the snake? Did God really say? What's he doing? He's introducing some words there to try and get people to disbelieve the things that God had said. And what's the first sin that comes out of a human mouth after Adam and Eve took of the apple? Adam. Adam, what happened? The woman, she did it. Blame shifting. Words. Hmm. We should think about that for a second. The conflict of the tongue, good and evil, is inconsistent with God's design. Now, remember, James models a lot of his rhetoric and a lot of his, his, his argumentation from what he saw in his older half-brother Jesus Christ, and it's very easy to chart some of the similarities. Uh, Matthew seven fifteen through 20, for example, beware of the false prophets or the people who profess to be Christians or the people who profess to be Christian leaders. Beware of them who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Meaning, guess what? You're going to figure out what they're all about when you watch their lives and you listen to them. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Natural analogy, spiritual implications. Natural analogy, no one will deny it. But Jesus brings the spiritual reality up and people put him on a cross. This is real. It's very simple. It's very, it's very basic. I don't say that condescendingly. I say that, like, look, I can't make it more simple. Jesus didn't make it more simple. <laughs> it's a thistle bush. Are grapes going to grow on this, you guys? And they're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? We're farmers. We know what we're doing. No, that's not possible. Is a fig tree going to produce olives? Well, Jesus, that would be, yeah, that would, that's never happened before. I don't think that that's going to happen. And Jesus is saying, okay, well, pay attention then. This is important then. If this is an impossibility, and I'm saying that this is an impossibility, why will you agree with one and gnash your teeth at the other? It boils down to this. If people bless God on Sunday and then curse their fellow man throughout the week, or backbite, or slander, or gossip throughout the week, if that is the pattern of their life, they are like a good tree that produces bad fruit. It is impossible, Jesus says. Jesus said a good tree can only bear good fruit. James says the same thing Jesus just said. A fresh water spring cannot bring forth both fresh water and salt water, and a fig tree cannot produce olives. And he's speaking about the tongue. He's speaking about the tongue. 
It's intended to sound impossible because it is, and a Christian shouldn't be a hypocrite or a contradiction of the faith they proclaim. The Christian will guard their tongue. They will not utter praise to God and gossip about their Christian brother or sister. They will not bless and curse with the same mouth. James 1.26, and we preached over this in, 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 in one of the first sermons here. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Guess what a worthless thing is worth? Nothing. And when I put religion and nothing together, that means this is false. That that religion is not worth anything. That it's not real. That it needs to be thrown into the fire, as Jesus said, and consumed. My heart is that we grow in Christ together and we do what God's commanded us. That when we have issues with the brother or sister, that, that it's not like this. Because I've seen this happen before in church. I'm not just making this up. This is from eyes on, Christy and I. There's a group over here, and they don't like the color of the carpet. And they get on Facebook, and they start typing about how much they don't like the color of their carpet at church. And there's a group over here. And this group is on Facebook, and ding, 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 the notifications go off. They say, well, Clarice does not like the color of the carpet, so I'm going to let her know what I think. And then eventually these two groups start going back and forth over something as simple as the color of a carpet. And then before too long, Clarice has her crew, and Frankie has his crew. Whoever those people are have their crews, and then they split a church down the middle over something as godless as the color of a carpet. Because words have power, they have meaning, they have significance, and we should understand that we cannot wield them as careless weapons. I wouldn't just take a box of throwing knives and just, yeah, throw them out into the, oh, well, yeah, it'll, it'll hit the aisle. I wouldn't do that. That would be incredibly irresponsible, dangerous, and foolish of me to do that. But how many people do that with their words? That's eh, just broken glass and barbed wire and throwing knives. <laughs> and they can do that simply by typing. Let us not be a people that's anything like that because guess what else is happening and going on? Everybody on the outside is looking at the Christians fight themselves. Newsflash, if you're a Christian, you're at war, Ephesians 6. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Here's the weapons of our warfare, intercessory prayer, the proclamation of the gospel, public preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ, and Christian love. There's some weapons for you. That's, that's a great thing to put in a box and throw right out in the middle of the congregation. My love, my prayers, my care for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and my faithful desire to teach as much as I can about who he is. That's a great thing to shake up in a box and throw in the middle of a church. Let us be a people that does that because I guarantee that that will set the world on fire in a positive way for Christ Jesus. It took 12 guys, 12 guys to grab the world and flip it on its axis shortly after Jesus died. 12 guys by what they spoke with their mouths. And they did it for good and they did it for God. Let us be a people that does the same. Father, I am so thankful, God, that we, can, we have the ability to speak and to communicate to one another. Lord, that we have the ability to um, bless others with the words that come out of our mouth, to encourage, to uplift, to exhort, to upbuild, to train in righteousness, simply by professing the things that you have said already. God, we believe the Bible. We believe that it's true. I do. And our heart and our desire and our hope is that we will see other people see the excitement and the joy and the love that we have. And from that, God, that they will want to understand what's so different and so strange about us because we don't look anything like the world. And God, convict us of sin in areas that maybe we look like the world. God, that we can repent of those sins, unload that wickedness, and move away from it. 
and not let that sin boil and fester and hurt and cause further division. Because we're a people who loves you first and loves each other second. I thank you for every person here, Father, that you would, God, just heavily press upon them the power of the tongue, the power of their speech, and that we would be found faithful with what we do and who we are. Dearest God, it's in the name of Christ Jesus that we pray in accordance with your will that we ask. Amen.